Hello and welcome back to the Girl Fit Method podcast. I am so excited to have on today's podcast episode, Christina. Christina, I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name. I, I wonder if I should give it a crack. Okay, let's go. Oh, geez. I'm going to butcher this. With, with, oh, no, I'm actually not even going to try. No, okay. no, 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 no. Try, oh, try, try. Okay, okay. Definitely try. With, with, <laughs> with, oh, with, oh, with, Lucas? Oh no, that was horrendous. Okay, Wait, but you, you you got it. You got the start right because people normally don't do the third. They like, they put the they That's just the I don't know, they say T Vitalkus, but it's Vitalkus. That is not easy. Vithalkus. Yeah, it's Greek, Greek last names are never easy. Yeah, no, they aren't. That's a that's a tricky one. Well, welcome, yeah. welcome thank anyway. you, thank you for having me on. My absolute pleasure. I'm so excited to jump into your story. So first of all, I'm just going to set the scene of how I will have come about to know you in a virtual sense because we've never met in person, but you are from where I live, which is in Adelaide, Australia. Now, I think I found you through an, a, like a guy that I followed on Instagram and I saw your account and I kind of got a bit of a grasp of your story. And I was like, this girl has like the most amazing vibe and amazing attitude. And I always feel like the exact attitude that you have is what I want to surround myself with because it's so inspiring for me. And I was like, oh, I could get this girl on the podcast to share her story. So that's how I kind of found you. And then I sent you a voice memo and then we've been able to dump on this now. So, uh, and I'm sure all the listeners will get to know exactly and understand exactly what I'm talking about as we go through the interview, because you're incredible. So Thank you. I've, pumped, I've pumped up your tires there. <laughs> I hope you really definitely, can. definitely. Oh no, it's absolutely all true. Um, all right. So let's um, find out a little bit more about you. Do you want to tell us, I guess like a really quick overview of who you are and then maybe we can chat about um, not too far deep into your childhood, but kind of what growing up looked like for you um, and then where that's brought you to today. Yep. So I'm, oh my God, I was going to say 27, but I'm 28 now. I'm You're getting old. so much older. Um, <laughs> so I'm a 28 year old and I'm actually from the Riverland, South Australia, but I've lived in Adelaide for three years and I'm, I'm basically in Adelaide every week because um, there's nothing much in the Riverland. And I, um, you know, grew up, um, in the Riverland and moved to Adelaide, trying to study teaching, wasn't for me, dropped out, was doing hospitality. Then I moved to the construction industry where I ended up um, actually starting to ride dirt bikes at like age 18. So through uni, um, those years I started riding dirt bikes as well as trying to study. Um, and then I had my accident, which um, if people don't obviously know me on here, I became a T5 paraplegic, which basically means from below the chest, I'm completely paralyzed. Like there's like no chance of me walking again. And that happened. So that happened four and a half years ago. I was, what was that? I'm not good at maths. What, 24 years old, <laughs> 23 years old. And that's me. Yeah. And then um, <laughs> at the time I was living in Victoria because of an ex of mine, broke up with him, moved back to SA. And now I have found the passion uh, of drifting and I'm building a drift car at the moment, traveling around Australia and just, I guess, just living my life as best as I can. That is unreal. And there's like so much to unpack in your story. I'm sure that's just like a really quick overview. <laughs> what I want to focus on is I guess like, let's go back to when you were younger and I'd love to know, you know, you're such a great incredible role model and positive person now I'd love to know was that how you were from day dot or is it something that you've kind of an attitude that you've adopted as you've gotten older and as you've had to face certain circumstances in life a bit of both because I feel like from day dot or well, at least my childhood growing up had the biggest role in my attitude like forming who I am as a person like when you take away you know your a lot of things in life experiences of like who you are as a human being and what your soul just like naturally wants to do and be. Um, I feel like that comes down to a lot of who I am as I was growing up, but then getting older and just having these different like life experiences and stuff like that, it kind of just like affirmed the attitude. And just, if, if anything, it's just like 
made whatever attitude I already had just stronger and stronger and more profound. And it's just like, yeah. So as a kid growing up though, definitely, especially with like the type of parents that I had, like my dad, when I like I think back now to like my childhood, I'm like, Oh my God, like you can tell why I am the what like who I am today, just from the, the things dad and mum would repeat to us, especially dad just repeated himself. Like, so now I like, I believe in affirmations and manifesting and all that because of dad already doing that to us as a kid without mm. like me knowing what that was, but him kind of repeating the same things like telling us how lucky we are. We're so, you know, grateful to have a roof over our heads and being able to go to the shopping um, center and buying food. Like, you know, we're like the richest, even at the time, like compared to our family members and stuff like that, we weren't the richest, you know, we had duct tape in our kitchen, um, keeping the floor together. We didn't have nice cars. We didn't have all that. But dad would be like, we're richer than like everyone because we're happy and we have like, you know, always looking at the glass half full while other people look at the glass half empty. And like, now when I look at my injury, I'm like, yeah, that's the same same thing. Like that's exactly how I took on the injury when I was paralyzed, like day one. That's why I, I've said in like previous um, podcasts, like day one when my injury happened, I'm like, I'm fine. Like I'm going to be totally okay. And everyone was like, you know, like, oh, one day it's going to hit you and like reality is going to hit. And it's like four and a half years later, I'm like still glass half full. Like it hasn't changed, but the injury kind of put my attitude in the spotlight. So it was kind of like, okay, I've, I've always had this. This is who, always who I've been, but it kind of was like, okay, put it up to the test and everyone got to see it and everyone's like, oh, my God, like this like, incredible attitude you have from your paralysis. I'm like, I kind of like was brought up like this as well. So. Well, that's the funny thing. So like as you're talking, you're talking about this and your attitude that you have like so casually as if it's just easy. But mm. the reality is like most human beings just want to focus on the negative. And so many people will focus on the negative and maybe haven't actually been through half the things that you potentially have been through and will still find it so difficult to see the positives in life. Mm -hmm. I want to delve into that more. But first of all, I think it's important to let the listeners know a bit about your injury. So how it occurred um, and maybe what the recovery process was like as well. Yep. So with the injury, I was jumping I don't know the distance, but if you can convert 55 feet, I'm not sure how many meters that is, but 55 foot jump, about 10 meters in the um, air, I jumped and I came short, mistimed it, came short, I bounced off the bike and like landed next to my bike on my head and scorpioned. So my bum came back and hit the back of my head and was knocked out for five minutes, fractured my skull, ribs, lacerated spleen, uh, ligament damage in my neck and shoulder. And broke obviously my two, five, six, and seven. So I did my back as well. But considering that was actually pretty good. Um, and I was, <laughs> I was like, it sounds very good, but <laughs> I mean, as in, like, no, like, considering those, like, I've never broken a bone in my life. And yeah, okay. when I do it, I do my three, my three vertebrae. Yeah. Um, and I was on the ground for like five minutes. I was knocked out. It was like incredible the amount of pain I was in when I woke up. Like, I, I can't even, I've never had bir- like a baby, but I could just, pitch it was worse than childbirth it was so intense and I had to wait for 45 minutes before the ambos came because I was at a place that was like an hour out of Adelaide in the middle of nowhere so then I um got airlifted to rural Adelaide hospital was in ICU for three days when I had like my surgery they had to do a sick it was supposed to be a four-hour surgery but it ended up being six hours I lost six liters of blood got like two rods and 12 screws put in me so and then I was in ICU for three days at Adelaide Hospital for three weeks. Then I got transferred to Melbourne for about five days before I went to the rehab and was at rehab for two months. But, like, they expected me to be there for minimum three months. I'm just, like, a stubborn Greek, so I was just like, no. I got Christmas, I want to be with my family. So, like, I got out there as soon as possible. And, yeah, so that was basically the recovery. It was really full on. Yeah, insane, absolutely insane. So, okay, so that's happened to you and you've just kind of touched on the fact that like you just felt like you were going to be okay and like you were just going to make the most of your situation. During the period of like really recognising and understanding what your injury was and what that meant and how your life was going to change, did you ever have at any point during that time so you did struggle or were you – I guess like felt sad or had to like, how did you process that? Or was it pretty easy? Did you just kind of go, 
I know this, this this is the part like it's just so hard to like explain because it's just like it was so normal to me like it's not normal just so I didn't have to struggle and it, no, at no point did I struggle to accept what my injury was I knew I didn't know exactly what it would in like tail and what I would have to overcome and what I've learned and there's just so much more behind the scenes that people don't see but like I just that wasn't even my issue I just knew I was like okay there's gonna be hurdles I'm just gonna have to go over these hurdles to live the life that I want and because I see the prize of life and enjoying life and having you know all these awesome moments like I'm like I don't care what hurdles I have to do to get to that like it just it just was to me just a longer track to the destination but as long as I, I'm like, I'm, as long as I get to that destination, then I'm fine. So I just, I can't like, uh, yeah, I don't know how to explain it. No, I mean, I think you've explained it amazing, like, and perfectly. Um, and you're, you're actually so incredibly right. Like really the gift that we have of just the air in our lungs, that's the thing that we should really be most grateful for. And what I'm thinking in your situation is, you actually couldn't do anything anyway. And so, and I think with all of us, we get ourselves into situations where we actually can't change things and we've got two options. We either accept that, okay, this is my new reality or this is what I'm going through at the moment. What am I going to do in order to make the most of it or to get over it? Yeah, and... Yeah, sorry. Sorry, no, you go, you go. I would say or, or what you do is you focus on what you can't do and you play that victim. And then what you want to think about is like where does that victim mentality get you and what do you get out of that? The funny thing is I think like we are wired, like human nature, we're wired to focus on what we don't have and the negatives. And so there's something like there is something – that we're getting from that. And I think playing the victim kind of feels kind of feels fulfilling in a way, but it sets us up for failure. Yeah. So, you know, I know you've been through a lot of other things as well in your life. And I was listening to your conversation with JP. So you're on another podcast episode and you touched on a relationship that you had that was really toxic. Mm. And if you don't mind, I'd love to chat about that because what I was thinking is, you know, the situation with your accident there was something that you were in con- somewhat in control of, of how you were going to act. The relationship that you touched on that was really toxic, there was a lot of manipulation there. And I just wonder how you've got this incredible attitude, how you were able to display that within that relationship or whether that was kind of taken away from you. Does that make sense? Kind of, like, do you mean my, like how I, like this attitude, how did I, if I had it all this time, how it was being displayed in the relationship while it was being very. Yeah, I would say that because, you know, I I would assume from what I gathered from that conversation is that you weren't really free to be yourself completely. So Mm. how did that impact the positive way that you view life? Well, that's like the main reason why I left was because I, for some reason, I don't know why, and you will never get this from domestic violence victims. And like always people will say like, why did you say, why didn't you just leave? And like, you can't, unless you've been through it, you, you don't understand. And it's like, you think that you love yourself and you think, yeah, like everything's happening. You're like, you kind of just, you just know that you're such a good person that it actually kind of backfires on you because you give other people and you just you, you become like a, such a big people pleaser and you want to just keep everyone else happy because, you know, if everyone else is happy, then you're happy. And that's where it kind of like bites you in the ass because you're not setting any boundaries for yourself and you're kind of accepting being treated like shit because like in my head I literally convinced myself, I was like, I'm just too nice. Like I'm just, I just love too hard and like no one would, no one can love me the way I love others. Like I just, I just got to accept that I'm just a really <laughs> good loving person. And that was just a complete lie. Um, and with the relationship, I just learned. And that's, I think I would say this actually, I'm not sure if I said this in the podcast, but I've said it to so many people. I've just never said it online. I would always joke, not joke. I was serious, but everyone thought I was joking. 
when I was in hospital, when I was in ICU, when I was in um, the hospital, the rehab nurses would come up to me, like nurses and people would be like, oh, my God, like you're so resilient. Like, you know, how, like, how, how have you become so resilient? And I would joke and be like, oh, putting up with this one, like my ex at the time. And everyone would laugh and I was like, no, Thank literally, you. like oh, I'm not kidding yeah. you. I would get physically abused and be like crying and being yelled at slut shame like just calling me and I would have to just sit there and just learn I'm like Christina you want to be happy so whatever you like that's coming at you just ignore it just ignore it just let it let it come and you if you you, if you want to be happy you can't let what that happens affect the rest of your day and it got to a point it was about maybe eight months before my injury I what I read a post and I think you probably would have seen it too it went viral all over the world on Facebook and it was a girl that was like 27 and she was dying of cancer and she wrote like this like goodbye letter him cancer that girl was i don't she know she was, bl- she was blonde yes yeah oh my God, i read the exact yeah, yeah you know yeah. what one i'm talking about so and yeah. that like just struck a chord to, and i was just like i remember thinking to myself like, all right if i'm gonna stay in this relationship i have to accept the fact that i'm with this whatever <laughs> um and if I want to be happy, I just got to just see the beauty in life with everything else. So I would, I just learned, and from now, that's when I really learned to just like block it out, block it out. And we would have a, you know, a fight and I will just be like, right, I'm going to take the dogs, go take them down the river and just like, and I say that like it literally prepared me for my injury. Because then when I had my injury, it was, this, it was just like the same thing. I'm like, right, I know I'm just about to cop all this negative energy. People are going to say all these things. I'm going to get told I can't do this. I can't. And, just treat it like I've just been treating my ex and just ignore it. Just stay in your own lane, have that like tunnel vision and just don't just block it out. But I never really like posted about that stuff. But like now I'm like, I'm free to yeah, just say whatever yeah. I want. <laughs> That's so interesting. It was almost like, and I truly do believe this, no matter how bad a situation is and, I, I, you know, there are terrible situations in life and maybe I shouldn't say that, but I, I think that for majority of us when we look at, seasons of our life where things weren't great there is always a silver lining we can take from mm-hmm. that and a lesson yep. that we can take and that does go back to that choice of how you view things whether you do view things as a victim because there it would have been much easier when you were in that situation to internalize that negativity and to actually let that stop you from finding joy yeah and that's why when I um, made the decision to leave I, that's what I was so like I, I can't explain it other than like it was just I woke up out of a coma that's how I felt with this injury because I was just like now I've got to take accountability like I've been letting this stuff go but my if I'm like why am I crying and upset when I've just been paralyzed and this is like this should be bothering me I should be crying over that and I'm crying over someone else and I, and I have control of taking myself out of that situation. The injury, I don't. This, I can control. So, like, it was like taking accountability. Like, nah, I want a better life for me. I don't want to be waking up crying every day. Like, there, my, I remember saying to myself, there has to be more to life than crying every day. Like, I, it's, it, this is normal. Well, I mean, yeah, and then on top of the fact that that's a romantic relationship where there should be love and there should be support, mm. that should absolutely not be the case. And maybe we should delve into this a little bit more because, you know, you're talking about a relationship here, but I would say that's the exact same mindset everyone needs to have in any situation in their life mm. where they actually have the choice. And like you said, and we touched on before, there are situations that you can't change. The only thing you can change is the way that you think about it. But how many people live their life in situations where they can make a choice? Yep. They stay in a situation, they justify it, whether that's they can't. I mean, um, we're talking about relationships here and with domestic violence, there is absolutely situations where people feel like they can't leave. Mm. And, um, you know, we need to be really mindful of that. But there are so many other situations in life where people are miserable. And it could even be just like a career, right? You hate your job, but I feel like I'm stuck. Well, are you stuck? What can Mm. we do to fix things? And when we realize like we are in control of every single decision that we make and the way that we live our life, it is incredibly freeing. But it does take a lot of bravery and it does take silencing negative thoughts, silencing the fear that's in your mind. And usually that fear actually 
isn't as no. bad as you actually presumed it was going to be. Absolutely. Like you always think like, it's, and it's never, it's never as bad. The anxiety, the stress. And it's like, once you do it, it's actually never as bad. Like leaving a job before, I remember like one, one of the jobs I quit and I was just like stressing and all like because I'm feeling bad of letting the boss down. It's like, but like how, why do we put everyone else's, emotions yeah. before our own like and that's one thing that's why I love this injury because that's one thing I didn't have growing up was putting my own needs first so this was just like no nah, what well, I want to be happy okay well what do I have to do to be happy I've got to take accountability and I'm going to put myself first and not people please as much as I've used to so I was talking to a friend the other night and same thing about like the relationship and I, I taught and my advice like I'm not as a friend, I used to hear girls complain about the boys I seeing and hearing this and that. And I used to be like, oh, it's all right, babe. Like, you're gorgeous. No, I'm going to like tell, like now I'm, like, I'm not going to give them what they want to hear because I want them to be happy. So now I'm going to tell them stuff that they don't want to hear. That's not going to, you know, make them feel any more calm and comforted by what I'm going to say I'm going to give them the truth which they're not going to like but I feel better about it because I know it's going to give them that little bit of a motivation to actually like Mm. stick to what they want and they know they deserve better I'm like don't don't accept that shit from guys like yeah 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 the people pleasing is so is so interesting and I'm generalizing here but I'd say like I think more females suffer with it than men And um, from what you're talking about, I can absolutely resonate with that. In fact, I'm single, right? So I'm dating at the moment. And I was so proud of myself last weekend, went on a date with a guy, wasn't feeling it. And I can't tell you how many times I've gone on dates with guys. I'm not feeling it, but I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. So I keep going on dates with them. And I'm like, I actually don't want to be with you, but this is very weird. But I'm too scared to say, uh, like, no, because I don't want to hurt your feelings. So what am I doing? I'm going on these dates, wasting my time because I'm worried about how they feel. And then I thought, okay, I need to challenge that. So I told this guy, lovely guy, but I just was like, you know, friend vibe, you know, I said, yeah, yeah. lovely thing. It was really nice spending time with you, but um, I just kind of feel like we've got a friend vibe and I can't tell you how uncomfortable that made me and how like it was the hardest thing. And that's just a very trivial like excuse. But if you go into life with that mindset, you can end up living a life that you don't want and that is purely for others. Or and- what I was saying to like my friend, you're just prolonging. So whatever yeah. you're doing, you're just taking the longest route around instead of just, if you just cut it off from the first date, you could have probably met someone even better, but instead you were still playing around with that and it's just like you're just prolonging what you want anyway so you might as well just cut it off short get things done faster and like yeah. the, the sooner you do it the sooner better things are going to come absolutely and like I feel like the more that you do it and you get used to doing it it's like working a muscle the mm-hmm. less uncomfortable you're going to feel in that yep. situation but I think thinking about people pleasing and the reason that we people please is really interesting as well and like just going back to your relationship you know, for you, you justified it in that you were like, look, I'm just the kind of person that loves hard. And so I just won't actually ever find someone that's going to love me as much. So I'm just going to sacrifice more or I'm going to give more in a relationship. And I just need to accept that, which was a complete lie. Mm -hmm. And I would say there was like manipulation from your ex's perspective on him justifying his behavior. So that's how you kind of probably justified that thought process. And it doesn't even need to be an unhealthy relationship in that instance, but we do justify why we people please. And there are always reasons why we people please. And a lot of that can come down to maybe feeling like we don't deserve what we deserve, low self-worth and caring too much about what other people think and living our life for other people because we're too scared to stand up for ourselves. Yeah. Um, and for you, it sounds like that transition of learning that and being like, you know what, screw it. Like I've got to live my life for me was the injury for you. And mm-hmm. what's been like so inspiring is just the opportunities that have actually come from that. And maybe talk about that. Like, so from that shift, that mindset shift, how has your life changed? Well, like you said, like we growing, we're growing up and we're just used to it and you're like, you don't want to like disappoint others or make others uncomfortable. But it's just like you said with the muscle, like you're just trying to practice 
and work a certain muscle to get that stronger kind of is the same as experiences. So after my injury, I slowly started. I could never say no. I just slowly started saying no to certain dinners or certain catching, you know, catching up with people. I'm like, no, no, I've got to put my health at first because I'm like, you know, getting tons. I was literally getting tons. I get tonsillitis when I'm worn out. Mm. I was getting tonsillitis because I'm putting people's needs because they want to catch up with me. I'm like, all right, no worries. I'll catch up. And I'm like sick, tonsillitis, dying. Um, so I was like, no. So I said no because of my health. And then it became, no, I don't want to hang out with these people. Like I, I not that they're not, they're not saying anything bad to me. They're not physically hurting me. They're not like, but the fact that my energy was just off around them, I found that's a good enough a re- like reason to not hang out with them. Like mm. I don't need to explain. I don't need to. And you just slowly have more and more experiences of like putting yourself first and it makes you feel better because you actually end up witnessing it firsthand because I put myself first. I've, um, I've helped future me now and the future me could feel the reward of putting myself first. So then you kind of get addicted to that feeling and then you do it more and more. So it's one of those things that you won't feel it until you start doing it. And yeah. then you just start getting just like a workout. When you do a workout, you just, you don't want to do it. You never want to work out. Then you do it. How good do you feel after a workout? Yeah. Like you yeah. love, you never regret it. Exactly the same as putting yourself first. You don't want to do it. You want to put your body under that stress. And then once you do it, you're like, fuck it. Future me looks better, feel better about it. Um, and yeah, with that injury, definitely. And that's why I feel like people don't understand why I'm so grateful for my injury. I'm like, cause if I didn't have my injury, I, I would have stayed in that same mindset. And I'm just so glad that the injury pushed me to be like, no, nah, I have no choice, but to put it, put myself first cause of my injury. But I hope girls or guys listening to this podcast can just sit back and think like, okay, I don't need to be paralyzed to just do what Christina's doing because you don't need an injury to do this. You just, just have to just want the best for you. Mm. Oh, I love that. Actually, <laughs> on that, I, I really want to just touch on this subject. So we work with women across the globe, right? We work with women that are mothers, that are students, that are, I don't know, lawyers, that are dentists, that are models, that are all of these women. Mm-hmm. And what absolutely blows my mind as a coach, as I meet these women and I think they're incredibly accomplished, they are intelligent, they are ambitious, they're smart, they're kind, they're funny. They're all, I see so much beauty in them. And it doesn't matter how accomplished these girls are, they really struggle with Mm self-worth. And a lot of that is derived from the way that they look in their body. And as women, a lot of our currency comes from what we look like. And a lot of that can be a real focus on the way that our body looks. Now for you, I would, I'm so interested to hear your relationship with your body, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the control of the way that your body looks like has been somewhat taken away from you and obviously how you can use your body as well. So do you want to just touch on what that looks like? What that your, maybe what your relationship with your body was like prior to the accident and then what it's like now? Yeah, well, the, like I would say out of the injury, like if anything I struggled with, and I, I can't say struck, like it wasn't a struck, it was the only thing that I probably was just like actually second thought things is the looks, 100%. And that's incredible to think it wasn't the inability to mm. urinate on my own, do the bowels myself, like, you know, I have to sit on the toilet sometimes for an hour, manual stimulate, it is a full on, and none of that bothers me. But yeah. I'd be like, oh my god, my belly's bloated because I'm paralyzed. Like, I would literally start. So, and like, I know I was watching your stories before this podcast, and it was like, do you have an unhealthy relationship with food? And this it is. I was like, yep, yep, yep. Because <laughs> I and I explained to my cousins as well. I'm like, I shouldn't say that I have an eating disorder because I don't have an eating disorder. But in a way, I can relate because I don't have an eating disorder for my looks a little bit because of the bloatiness, but more so the worst relationship with food because of my bowels and doing the toileting and stuff like that. So I just, anything I think of with my body and body image, I struggled with, with the injury was just the injury before the injury. I was confident. I had abs. I had a V I did think for some stupid reason, I hated the cellulite on my thighs. And now I have a twin sister. So for those that don't know, I have a twin sister and she's got big legs and she will like look at me and complain. She's like, Oh, my legs are so, and I'm like, I would do anything to have, big 
chunky cellulite filled stretch mark filled legs right now like but yeah so I, I would say though my confidence with my body was okay before the injury with the injury that's what I struggled with the most dating when I be- then became single I was just like shit like you know even in bed like performance wise like I'm like I don't look the way I do before my body's not tense it's not toned it's not like and I remember with like just my confidence was just so it was so solely focused on the wheelchair and me and going on that self-love um journey it took it took a while so it took at least a good year and a half of really doing some inner work and working on me as a person and kind of realizing that no matter what I look like because you could still girls I feel like compare themselves to any like everyone else they see on social media and I catch myself out doing that too but then what helps me with my confidence what everything like every time I do that to myself or when I like self-sabotage I always go down to like just I picture it's it sounds weird but I picture humans without their bodies and just as souls and like what energy that they can bring to a room and what and, and how you make others feel and every time I think of that I'm like yeah okay fine I might be paralyzed but I know I, my energy is like through the roof and I know I can just change the energy in a whole room and make everyone happy and I work like I started just putting my value into that. Like, don't worry about what you look like. You're valuable because, you know, you could meet a 10 out of 10 model and treat people like shit, make someone feel worthless, not give, you know, people the time of the day. So you just got to, like, go back to, like, don't don't look at the materialistic, like, side of things and just, like, look at, like, how you, yeah, who you are as a person. Oh, I couldn't have summed that up. Well, better myself, the second part of it. I, I want to just say I can completely understand, my goodness, like the transition of going from an able body and being in control of the way that your body looks to not being in control. And I think absolutely anybody on the planet would have struggled with that. Um, and it's so understandable. What's funny is I think about you and I think like your attitude and your energy and your hard work and your ambition radiates so much beauty and it radiates actually so much attraction and I have zero doubt people are attracted to you and I'm not just talking about in a sexual way I yeah I'm I'm mindset way absolutely and when we think back on our life and the people that have made impacts in our life and the people that we want around us the people that we want to be like it's all good and well to look hot, but there's like an expiry date on that. You'll look hot for a certain amount of time until you get to an age. And then do you know what? You get wrinkly and no one looks at you anymore, right? Yeah. No one looks at you. So then where does your value lie? Or, you know, you, God forbid, like have an injury, right? And I'm mm-hmm. not saying it can happen to, life can throw curveballs at all of us. And if we place all of our importance and our value on the way that we look, we're really setting ourselves up for failure because at some point we've got to go, okay, well, what actually do I have to bring to the table? Where does my confidence lie and what kind of person am I and what am I trying to bring to this world? What kind of legacy am I trying to leave? And I just think it's such an incredible reminder and thank you so much. Everything that you just said then is so bang on. Because yeah. when you actually find that your confidence lies with like the kind of person you are, it is actually incredibly freeing. Yeah. Because- and also like the people you're trying to attract, like for when I, I'm just referring to dating just because it's just, yeah. that's what was I was struggling with the most. And it's so freeing to know that you're not attracting people because of your looks. Like it's like, okay, I knew if I wasn't paralyzed and I could take the selfies that I was saying before, the amount of guys that I would have had trying to get my attention, the fact that I knew because of my injury, I had my Tinder profile with my wheelchair. I knew guys that were talking to me were like, this girl is paralyzed. Like she's going to be, you know, not extra work, I guess extra work. But like, and the fact that the guys that would still pursue, I was like, it's kind of like a benefit in my sense because I know the guy that is trying to go for me was like, okay, we're not just going for the physical side of things they really like who I am as a person yeah. um so yeah like I, I I like that part in the dating I was like with the injury I'm like okay well like I, I feel like I filtered out so many people that are just like looking for looks or 
Yeah, the wrong reasons. Yeah, and they're not the ones that are going to stick around either long term or the ones that actually truly are interested in you and care about you and see that in a value. Mm-hmm. And it's just so surface level. Yeah. I mean, the dating world, that's a whole new conversation, right? That's it's an absolutely wild place. And you can attract <laughs> people that are just like not who you want to attract. But even if we take it outside of the dating world, you might get attention for the way that you look and that's great. But you know, the pressure that comes along with that, right? So now you feel like you need to live up to people's expectations because that's all they care about. If you purely only work on the way that you look, then that's, and and that's what you think your value is. Mm. And that's how, that's the only reason people want to have you in their life. Then how empty does that eventually make you feel? Mm -hmm. I think if women like put more focus on who they were as a person and bringing that vibe and energy so that the kind of person that people are attracted to, then their focus is off the way that they, they look, right? And as we age, yeah. or as whatever happens, we gain weight, which is life. We all mm. do that. Then it doesn't actually matter as much because mm-hmm. you know that the most important thing is you and who you are, your soul and your character. Yeah, and you've already attracted the people like because, you know, they say like whatever you put out in the world is what you attract and you – Sit, like I'm, I'm not gonna attract people that are assholes, and even if I do, they're gonna like they just won't last in my circle because I'm not gonna tolerate that stuff. So if you focus on like, like who, what, like who am I as a person? What values are important to me? What do I want to tolerate? I was listening to a TikTok. A TikTok's like my therapy, um, and they were saying like they did this study on um, uh, I mean a beast guy or something. They were saying like if your friends, if your best friends with someone that's obese, you're 50% more likely to become obese. And then if that obese friend's friend is obese, you're again 20% more likely to become obese, so so on and so forth. And they said the the guys that did this study, the only conclusion they could come down to was that it's because you think whatever, whatever environment you're in, you're okay with that. Like So those examples, that's okay. So, for example, people that are, you know, not putting their mental health and their fitness and their happiness. First of all, we're not talking, you don't need to look like a model. You don't need to, as long as you're putting your health first and like eating right and having those as priorities, if your friends aren't doing that, like you're not going to see it as in, an important thing. That's why I focus on like, no, happiness is important. People that mo- are motivated, that want to like give life 110%, they're not going to be lazy. They're not going to take their bodies for granted. So I will only... Like, to me, that's okay. So those people I'm going to surround myself with. I feel like other people struggle because they might be in a friend group or a family group that it's not a priority. Like, mm. they're, it's, it's just like, oh, this is life and they just think it's just normal. So it's just like okay for them. Well, I mean, the, what's the biggest example of that in your life is your dad. Mm-hmm. And that's why you've got the attitude that you do. Yeah. That's why I must have brought up in environments around people that are negative, mm-hmm. that love to play the victim. And then when we get into situations that are difficult, we find it really hard to just get on with things and look at things positively. And the impact, because you were brought up around people that were positive, that tried to remind you of all the good in your life, that has influenced you. And then it's influenced your choices. And now it's influenced the direction of your life, which is... yeah. Amazing. And I had a I had a guy reply to my because I said something about like oh you are the five people that you hang around with the most and he goes oh well I don't even have any friends and I'm like that's still better that's still better than having the wrong group yeah. of friends around you so and I feel like a lot of people struggle with like oh I don't have friends or I don't have this or I don't it's like people struggle with being alone and doing inner work and actually focusing on themselves and I don't know why because at the end of the day you're like you're stuck in your own head. Yeah. for the rest of your life and you, only you are going to your grave on your own so it's like why don't you learn who you are become friends with yourself like your own company do more of what you want to do which will then you will then come across more people like yourself eventually but yeah. it's true and I think the answer to that is that it is much easier once again to blame the fact I don't have friends and I'm not saying that this person was but then doing the inner work because the inner work means you need to actually reflect on yourself, reflect on your thoughts and what you need to change, maybe what you're doing wrong to get to the place where you don't have friends or you're feeling the way that you're feeling. And that's harder, but it's much mm-hmm. easier to just blame your situation or your circumstances, unfortunately. But, you know, it gets you absolutely nowhere. Yeah, and the same thing that like repeats in my own head, like I always think of growing up, 
was like this video, a motivational video of a guy explaining um, like if you want to go for something, if you want something bad enough, you got to work for it. And he goes, all right, now I forgot how he goes, but something about like if you're drowning, if you're being, you're in the ocean, you're drowning and how hard you would fight to swim up for that breath of fresh air, like that first breath, like you would fight so hard because you know you're about to die. He goes, if you want something, you got to go for it as hard as that. And I always think about that with anything, with happiness. It's like people will say, oh, I want this. Oh, I want friends. Oh, I want to be happy. Oh, I want, yeah, but like what are you going to actually do to do it? You don't want it as bad as you want to breathe. So, you, and people have to take accountability. It's like, okay, you want to do, well, what step are you going to take today to actually get you that one step closer? It doesn't have to be a marathon to that step. You just need to do one thing. And I did that myself too with this injury. Like, I wanted to start my own merch and I just, I thought of it for years never, and I just, it's like, no, I need to take accountability. I want to do this and I haven't, like, just do one thing and that one thing led to another and then I got it in within one month. I sorted everything out. That Something that I was wanting to do for years, I did it in one month. So it was just one step. Incredible. I don't think there's, like, any kind of better last point we can finish the podcast on. So thank you so much. <laughs> I just want to say, like, <laughs> Keep doing what you're doing because I know you're living your best life and through that you're really making a positive impact on all those around you. So thank you so much and it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Uh, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. It's good to have you doing what you're doing because it all helps. It all helps. Everyone, like yeah. people just need to hear that one thing that might just motivate them to do another thing. So what you're doing is great and I'm, I'm honoured to be on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> 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 <laughs>